be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end Amen Amen Our text this morning comes to us from 2 Peter chapter 2 Uh, verses 10b, uh, right on down to 16. 10b, bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. You may be seated. Father, we come into your presence uh, this morning uh, to bring praise and glory and honor to your holy name. You have invited us in. We have praised you. We have acknowledged our sin before you. Uh, You have forgiven us of all of our sins in Jesus Christ. And now we come to the time where you instruct us so that we might be edified and sent out into the world to live the ways in which you would have us to live. I pray that you would help us to be attentive uh, during this time to your word so that we can do just that. Speak to our hearts. Speak clearly to us. I pray help me to get out of the way so that can happen and anything that I might say that is erroneous, let it fall away. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So why do we have standards in the world today? Uh, It seems like standards have fallen on hard times as of lately. People don't even really have standards anymore. It's just a wild, wild uh, west, and everybody uh, pretty much does uh, whatever they want according to their own standards. But nevertheless, we all have standards. Uh, If, for instance, you were to ask somebody who likes to jump out of planes for fun why they do that sort of thing, uh, you might hear them say something like, you know, live today for tomorrow we die, right? And that is a standard. That is a philosophy. It's not a good one, but it, it is a standard. I don't know why any person in their right mind would want to jump out of a plane, a perfectly good plane, but some people uh, want to do it. Uh, not to say that everybody who does it is crazy. But, uh, but they have standards. Uh, we all have uh, standards by which uh, we live our lives. Sometimes we are unconscious of these standards. Sometimes we are unwilling to admit these standards, but nevertheless, we do have them. Uh, And so that is what I want to hone in on today and drill down and ask the question, what are your standards? And do the standards that you have ultimately matter at the end of the day? And so I want to look at that from two different angles today, two different perspectives. And uh, the first is that God's word is the standard. And therefore, our feelings and our emotions are not. Uh, God's word is the standard, and therefore, our feelings and emotions are not. And the second is like it, God's word is the standard, and therefore, we are not. God's word is the standard, and therefore, we are not. So we see that first point in uh, verses 10b through 13a, (laughs) kind of uh, uh, dicing up the, the text today. And parsing it out. So 10b through 13a, I'll read that again uh, for you. Uh, 
10b begins, bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. Uh, last week, uh, Peter finished up by saying that the judgment was eventually going to come upon these false teachers uh, that he had been talking about or alluding to, uh, especially the ones who despise authority and give themselves to defiling passions. And we saw that those things could be applied to every one of us as well, uh, as it was made clear from the examples that Peter gave to us from uh, the Old Testament. Uh, despising authority, uh, giving yourself to defiling passions is a sin that will be judged by God, whether you are a false teacher or not. So it can be applied uh, to us. Uh, so this week, Peter is going to continue that discussion about uh, despising authority and drill down a little further into uh, that sin for us of despising authority. Uh, he says first there that these false teachers blaspheme the glorious ones. They blaspheme the glorious ones. Now, there is again a debate about this text and what Peter is exactly referring to when he mentions the glorious ones. Some say that it is the holy angels that Peter is referring to. Others say that it is evil angels that he is referring to. Some people think that it is civil magistrates or civil authorities that Peter is referencing when he talks about the glorious ones. And still others uh, think that he is referencing church authorities when he refers to the glorious ones. I tend to think that he is referring to holy angels uh, in this text. I cannot find a passage of scripture in the Bible that takes glorious and applies it to evil angels. It is most often connected uh, to God and his glory, and many times the holy angels are right there along with him. If you can find a text that connects the glorious or glorious with evil angels, please uh, give it to me. I'm not saying it's not there, but I just haven't found it. Uh, I've not scoured the entire thing. But anyway, this is my interpretation of it. I, I, I think that Peter is referring to holy angels when he mentions the glorious ones in this one. Uh, in this instance. Uh, so when it says that they blaspheme the glorious ones, it is talking about a special kind of rebellion. It is a rebellion that uh, despises the authority structures that God has placed over you. The, these false teachers uh, blatantly disregard the power and the prestige that holy angels have. He says that they are bold and willful, not trembling as they blaspheme these glorious ones. In other words, they have no fear of God-ordained authority. No matter which way you parse the text, that is the point that Peter is making. They don't have any fear of God-ordained authority or structures of authority that God has set up uh, in the world. They're ultimately despising the authority that God has placed over them. They, they make light of it. They, they treat it as if it is, it is nothing. Now, Peter does not exactly tell us how they blaspheme these glorious ones, but in some way, they disrespect them. Okay? They dishonor them. They disdain them. What's interesting to note is that angels, Peter says, who are greater in might and power than they are, then these false teachers are, do not speak blasphemous judgments before the Lord against them. In other words, they don't go beyond uh, what they have been told. They do not overstep the bounds of their authority. Angels only deliver the blessings and the curses that God has authorized them to deliver 
contrary to the false teachers who make themselves into judges, right? The, the, the false teachers make themselves judges. They make themselves gods, in a sense, arbiters of truth. Uh, they attribute to themselves power that they do not have, and for that they are condemned, and that is the point. So I think here it is an argument from the greater to the lesser, an argument from the greater to the lesser. If angels are uh, that much more powerful than they are, that much more, uh, much more powerful and glorious, uh, well, maybe not glorious, but much more powerful, as Peter uh, says, and they don't even do this sort of thing. How much more do false teachers have no right to do it? And how much more will they be condemned for doing so? So it's an argument from the greater to the lesser, in my view. Notice Peter says that they are like irrational animals, these false teachers. They're like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, and really they're ignorant. Look at uh, verse 12 again. He says, but these like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. In other words, these uh, false teachers are just like animals. Uh, they, they are brutish. They are ignorant and irrational. They, they, uh, they live and teach based on instinct, right? You, you, you think of a you think of an animal. An animal doesn't really know the difference between right and, and wrong, ultimately. Uh, animals don't celebrate birthdays like you and I do, and they don't remember the holidays. Uh, they don't have any real recognition of uh, the divine like we do. They are uh, many times uh, just being led by their instincts. Uh, many times they live their entire lives just looking for a meal, just trying to fill their bellies. And Peter is saying, in like manner, the false teachers are the same way, right? They're driven by their instincts and by their desires, okay? Um, false teachers do not base their lives or their teaching on revelation from God. Their lives and their teaching are based on instinct and appetite. They don't base their lives and their teaching on revelation from God, but their lives and their teaching is based on instinct and appetite. And that is what sets false teaching apart from true teaching. Uh, at the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves when we are being confronted with teaching, is this teaching based on the authority of God's word or is it based on the authority of man's? And that is one clear way to set false teaching apart from true teaching. Ask yourself at the end of the day, who does it serve? Right? What... What does this doctrine, who does this doctrine ultimately serve? Who does this person ultimately serve? What is the, gain, uh, the aim and the, the goal and the purpose of this false teaching or of this teaching at the end of the day? And if any way, in any way, it'll make something other than the glory of God, the ultimate aim and purpose, it is false. If in any way it makes something other than the glory of God, the ultimate aim and purpose, it is false since the glory of God is the aim and purpose of all things. You see? So that is one quick way to distinguish between true teaching and false teaching. What are its aims? What are its goals? Who is it exalting? Who is it pointing to? The person? The man? Is it exalting man? Is it exalting the person who's speaking or is it exalting Christ? Um, now, is... False teaching in our day any different? That's the question I want to ask us for reflection. Is false teaching any different in our day today than it was then? Are the goals and the aims of false teaching any different? Are the teachers any different than they were then? No, they are exactly the same. Again, we just have a much more refined and civilized form of the doctrine of self, which is ultimately what it is <laughs> uh, in our day. Uh, but nevertheless, it is still a doctrine of self. It is a philosophy of self, serving self, serving one's interest and desires 
being led by one's instincts and appetites. Uh, but in America today, what we have done is we have intellectualized the whole thing, right? You know, we, we're living in the age of reason, right? Where we've gotten rid of all those foolish beliefs about angels and demons and the spiritual realm and all the rest, right? We're, we're much more civilized. We're much more sophisticated living in 21st century America today. Uh, if we cannot test it in the lab today, if we cannot confirm it through the scientific method, or if I can't experience it through my five senses, then it's not real. And that is the heresy of our day. That is the heresy of our day. We think that we are much more sophisticated. Uh, those Puritans, those reformers, the early church fathers, those ignorant people in the ancient Near East, uh, they were just superstitious, right? They didn't have all the knowledge and information that we have today. And everything is now become uh, fleshy. This mentality has led ultimately to a despising of authorities, the same sin that the false teachers were committing in that day. It has ultimately led to a rejection of the authority of the word of God over us and all that it tells us about the, uh, the world around us, and it's led to a rejection of the wisdom that has been handed down to us from ages past, which has ultimately led to the exaltation of man over all things. That's what we see in our day. Man is being exalta uh, exalted and lifted up above uh, all things. Uh, the false teaching of our day teaches us that the only thing that really matters are the things uh, that we can experience, or the only things that are really real are the things that we can experience with our five senses. Got to be able to experience it with our five senses, which makes the mind and the body the end-all, be-all, right? So what is the ultimate gain, uh, aim and purpose in life? Well, stimulating this, right? And satisfying this. Stimulating my mind and satisfying my body. That has become the aim and the purpose of all things, especially in 21st century America today, the day in which we are uh, living. As I've said, everything is fleshy. Everything's fleshy. There's nothing outside of our experience. There's no spiritual realm out there. There's nothing outside of myself and outside of this world that I can see and touch. Everything is sensual today. Everything is based on our feelings and our emotions today, right? We're driven by our feelings. We're driven by our emotions and by our instincts. And everything is romantical. Uh, and what I mean by that is we're, we're doing everything based on our intuitions. And so what kind of philosophies do we hear being taught in our day? Well, you'll hear things like this, you know, just follow your heart. Right? You hear that a lot in our day. Just follow your heart. Right? Or, here's another one. It's real sensual. If it feels good, do it. If it feels good, do it. That is a main predominant philosophy uh, in our time. If it feels good, do it. And here's one, and I may step on a few toes with this. You can be whatever you want to be. You can be whatever you want to be. You'll hear that a lot. And these are doctrines of demons. The thing that it fails, these, the thing that these philosophies fail to recognize is that there are other authorities out there, that there are authority structures out there beyond us, that there are spiritual authorities that have been placed over us by God. God has revealed to us his authoritative word from heaven from the spiritual realm, and we must reckon with it. And in God's word, he tells us we can't just do what we want, right? We can't just sort of make it up as we go along. And there are things that we shouldn't do out there. We, we, we should not go beyond what is written. We should not make ourselves into gods and, and follow our own hearts. No, friends, the Bible tells us that there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. You see? So you got to be careful with what 
types of worldly philosophies out there you grab hold of and make them your own. Because we've been hearing this stuff, I've been hearing it since I was a little kid. And it's still predominant in our day. You know, follow your heart. If it feels good, do it. You can be whatever you want to be. All this stuff, right? And it's just sort of little quips. But people grab hold of these things and they live their lives according to them. And they're doctrines of demons. They are dangerous. Friends, trying to determine what is right and what is good and what is holy and what is just based on our own experience and our feelings and our opinions is bad juju, okay? It, it's the way of death, and it's no different than what the false teachers of Peter's day were doing. They were leading the people to follow their instincts, right? They were leading them to follow their bellies, to follow their lust, and ultimately they, the false teachers and their followers, were being led down the path of destruction. So the difference at the end of the day, and this is it, I'll sum it up like this. The difference at the end of the day between false teaching and true teaching is this. False teachers lead you to do and say what you want. You see that? What you want. False teachers lead you to do and to say what you want in your heart. But true teachers and true prophets are like the holy angels. They only tell you what God has said. Even if it's offensive. Even if it doesn't agree with you. right? Even if it doesn't line up with your philosophy of life. They only tell you what God has said. And they do not go beyond. So that is the difference. So God's word is the standard, and therefore our feelings and our emotions are not. We see that second point, God's word is the standard, and therefore we are not in 13b through 16. Let's go ahead and read that again. I'll just start in uh, 13. Suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing, they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. Accursed children, forsaking the right way, they've gone astray. They've followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression, a speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. First of all, Peter says they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. In other words, they do things in broad daylight that people usually only do under the cover of night. And they are not ashamed of their sins. As a matter of fact, they want to do them openly, possibly to get the, uh, the, the people to follow them in their, in their ways. Peter goes on to say they revel in their deceptions. They take pleasure in the fact that they do these things openly. Uh, uh, this is what they want to do. They get their satisfaction in doing them openly and deceiving their followers. Because if they can get you to follow them in their way, then they can get you to serve them, which is ultimately their goal, right? They want to serve themselves. And the way that they serve themselves is by getting you to serve them, right? And so if they, if they can do that, then they've done their work. They want to satisfy themselves. They want to exalt themselves, and they want to profit from your deception, and so they must deceive you and get you to follow them in the way in order to do that. You see how that works? <clears throat> Notice Peter refers to them as blots and blemishes. They're blots and blemishes. They're the very opposite of Christ, the lamb without blemish and without spot, and they're the very opposite of of what Christ and his people are supposed to be, and that is pure and holy and undefiled, right? And, and Peter says that they are at your feasts. And you may remember that we said in the early church, their gatherings surrounded this meeting. They would gather together and have this love feast together, at the end of which they would celebrate the Lord's Supper. So they were in the church, right? They're in the church, and that's why false teachers are so dangerous, because the church is to be pure and undefiled. 
The church is to be pure and undefiled, but these false teachers by nature are defiled and corrupt, and they work their way into the uh, church to corrupt the church from within. Peter says they are blots and blemishes in your feast, and we would say today in your gatherings. So they're in the church. You've got to watch out for them in the church, in your midst. Lastly, uh, and I have a slide for this, I want to mention what they do, why they do it, and how they do it, okay? Uh, what they do, why they do it, and how they do it. First, what they do. Peter says they have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. Uh, the first part of verse 14, uh, we read, they have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice, they entice unsteady souls. In other words, these guys are pigs, okay? Uh, they come into the church, and uh, they do not see things the way that you and I do. <laughs> they, they are looking underneath in their hearts at things that they ought not when they come into the church. Now, it seems that it's referring specifically to a, a, a type of sexual immorality. Peter says that they have eyes full of adulteresses, literally, right? Eyes full of adulteresses, and so they come into the church and they want, to, uh, they want to exploit women and take advantage of them. But I think it, it applies even further to anyone and anything that they can take advantage of. They come into the church looking for someone and something that they can exploit, right? They're always looking for some way to manipulate the church into giving them what they want, into satisfying their lust, to satisfying their desires. This is what false teachers do. Um, so that is what they do. Peter says they have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. Next, why do they do it? Why do uh, why they do it? Peter says they do it out of greed and to get gain from wrongdoing. The latter part of verse fourteen, he says uh, they entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way. They have gone astray. They followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. Peter uh, says specifically that they are trained in greed, these people. They're trained in greed. And the word uh, trained in Greek is gymnazo, which is where we get our English word uh, gymnasium. And so how do you get good at doing something? Well, you practice it. Uh, on a regular basis. You practice it all of the time, like a gymnast at the gym. And these people have been practicing greed for a long time. Okay? They are not just a little greedy, they're really greedy. And they're good at being greedy. Their greed controls them. It drives them. Money and profit from the deception of the church is their idol. That is the thing that they are after. It's the thing that keeps them going. It's the thing that their life and their ministry revolves around. It's as he goes on to say, they have forsaken the right way. Uh, that is, they've gone off the straight path, the, the way of truth, the way of life, and they have gone into the way of error, the way of death that we mentioned before, the way of Balaam, as Peter describes it here, the way of Balaam. Now, who was Balaam? Uh, in short, Balaam was a prophet in the Old Testament that sought to exploit the people of God for money by leading them into sexual immorality. He was a prophet who sought to exploit the people for money by leading them into sexual immorality. And Peter gives them an encouragement here. He says that Balaam was rebuked by a speechless donkey. You may, you may remember the story of Balaam. God tells Balaam that he can't, uh, he can't curse his people. He can only bless them because they are his people. And then he reminds them of it by a speechless donkey. And in the same way, Peter is saying these false teachers will not be able to deceive the church, but you must be discerning which every Christian can be, no matter what ilk you come from. A speechless donkey can rebuke a false prophet. Any Christian can be discerning and be able to rebuke a false prophet or discern a false prophet or a false teaching when they come across it. That is what I think Peter uh, is driving at with Balaam. So that is why. 
Which leads me to the last thing I want to highlight, and that is how these false teachers are able to get away with what they are doing. Uh, back in the latter part of verse 14, Peter says they entice unsteady souls. They entice unsteady souls. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. Uh, so what are unsteady souls? Well, they're people who are not grounded in the faith. Right? They're people who, who don't know the scriptures, who don't have a biblical worldview, uh, people who are not living an upright life in the sight of God, people who are not in the worship, uh, uh, in the, in the worship uh, meetings regularly, gathering together, taking part in the divine service, taking part in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, people that are not regularly sitting under the authoritative teaching of God's word, people that are not regularly fellowshipping together with the saints. These are unsteady souls. Right, Because they're not grounded in the faith the way they should be. This is how you remain grounded uh, in the faith. These people are unstable. They're on shaky ground because they're not grounded in the faith. And therefore, they're unsteady souls. And it's easy for them to be led astray. So again, what is the false teaching in our day? It is selfism. It, selfism is the predominant teaching in our age. We live in an age of self when the most important thing in the entire world is you, right? Uh, if you just look at social media in general, which is the biggest industry in one of the biggest industries, if not the biggest industry in the world right now, it is entirely aimed at exalting people. Right? What Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and these other platforms have done is created a platform where everybody can be a star. Right? Everybody can have followers. And people's livelihoods depend on it. Right? Their, their self-esteem depends on whether or not, or, or not they've gotten likes and followers on Instagram, especially younger people who have never lived without this sort of thing. They get their validation based on how many likes or followers they have on social media. And friends, I'm here to tell you that God did not create you to live for these things. He did not create you to live for yourself. He created you to live for him. And what does our culture tell us? What is the predominant philosophy of our day? Well, it's all the stuff, right? If you, get, if you get the entertainment, if you get the relationships, if you get the money, if you meet your, your job goals, all these things, they make that stuff an end in itself. Those things in our society and in our world become ends in themselves. And when those things become ends in themselves, they end up being abused. They're not used in the way that God uh, has intended. Right? And if you want evidence of that, just look at the way that uh, women are being exploited in movies and in music or the sexualization of our children uh, in our society. And again, if you want to make a false teaching the norm, what do you have to do? You've got to do it out there in the open, in the public eye, where everybody sees it on a regular basis until it just becomes a norm. Right? It just becomes normal, and we don't even bat an eye anymore when we see a music video with an almost naked woman on it being exploited, or when, uh, when money and cars and jewelry are being flaunted like, we're, like they're gods. We don't even bat an eye at the stuff anymore, because we've been so um, enculturated in the stuff for so many years. It just becomes commonplace to us. <clears throat> and this stuff has made its way into the church. The false prophets of our day are also capitalizing on it, by the way. Um, they are still just as greedy as they were then, <laughs> right? The false prophets come into the church with eyes full of adultery looking for, for uh, women and, and children that they can take advantage of. And anybody, really, who, uh, who uh, is interested in the same things that they are, right? Right? which is ultimately 
um, the satisfaction of themselves. They're looking for somebody like them who is interested in the satisfaction of themselves. And that is what these false teachers prey on. So if your God is a relationship, or if it is, uh, if it is money, or uh, if it is a job, or if it is success, or a career, or whatever, they'll promise that to you. <laughs> That's what a false teacher does. They promise that to you in exchange for your support of them, right? False teachers, and this is an important principle for us to get, and I'll state it again, it's a little bit different. False teachers give you exactly what you want. You hear that? False teachers give you exactly what you want, and that is a judgment in itself, that they give you the very thing that you want. That is why we have to be discerning. That is why we cannot be unstable people and no different than the rest of the world when it comes to the idol of self. So what are we supposed to do about it, friends? Well, we must inculcate a biblical worldview into our lives, and we have to be intentional about it because the world has been trying to the world's constantly trying to press us into its mold. And we've grown up in it. We've been living in it for so long. It is the air that we breathe. And so we are going to have to make an intentional effort not to allow our minds to be shaped by these things. We're going to have to make an intentional effort to reshape our minds. And that means we can't get our facts from Facebook, right? We can't, we can't get our truth, we can't ultimately go and look for truth uh, in movies and in music and in television. Because I'll tell you, friends, it is very easy for you to create an alternate world for yourself to live in if that is the only truth that you have. And so many people literally think that what they are being sold by the media is reality. Because that is the only world that they live in. Right? So what must we do? Well, we must learn truth. We must know truth. Here's a couple ideas. Read books. Read good books. Read lots of books. Read old books writ written by dead people. I'm telling you. <laughs> learn history. Learn what our ancestors have said and done, right? Learn about those who have gone before us. Learn what God has been doing in the world in years past, because God has been at work in the world for thousands of years. So what has he been doing? What have the people of God learned? What kind of wisdom have they discerned? How have they gone about these same problems that we're facing today? And we've got to learn the Bible. We've got to learn the scriptures, right? We, we have to imbibe the scriptures, as I've been saying. We have, to, we have to let the scriptures become a part of us. Let them become the air that we breathe. Because then what happens later on down the road when we're confronted with a false narrative that does not comport with the truth of reality, that does not comport with the world that God has created that does not comport with the truth of God's word. Well, you'll know it in a moment, right? But we must know truth, right? We must have standards. Truth matters. Standards matter. And everybody has them. And what you believe to be true has an effect on how you will live. We're seeing that day in and day out. So God's word is the standard, and therefore we are not. God's word is the standard, and therefore we are not. So everybody has standards. Uh, if we're conscious of them, or if we're willing to admit that we have them, is another story. But everybody has standards, and I hope you've seen that today. And I hope you've seen that the standards 
that we have matter. So it's good for us to do an examination of ourselves once in a while and ask ourselves the question, does what I believe line up with the truth of God's word? Does what I believe uh, line up with what this per- or is what this person's telling me line up with the truth of God's word? Does this idea that I'm being confronted with in culture line up with the standards of truth found in God's word? Because at the end of the day, every Christian has been given a final standard to which they must appeal. And it cannot be found in ourselves. It's not found in our emotions or in our feelings or in our opinions. It's only found in the pages of Holy Scripture. And so that must be our final appeal. That must be the standard by which we live, believe, and do everything that we do. So we must ask ourselves, friends, when we are being confronted with a question out there in the world about how we are to live or how we are to believe, we must constantly be asking ourselves according to what standard? According to what standard? According to what standard? God's standard or ours? And for the Christian, it must always be God. Let's pray. Father, we are confronted with uh, lies and destructive heresies all the time. We've been living in it. We've grown up in it. Many times uh, we, we don't know the difference because it's just second nature to us. Uh, Help us to be discerning. Help us to root worldly philosophies out of our lives. Let us only 